right, so we are going to start Anatomy 2 with Chapter 10, The Nervous System. It's actually going to be uh, Chapter 10 and 11 that kind of covers this, these concepts. Uh, they tend to be um, pretty in-depth. So pay close attention, take good notes, and you may want to watch this even more than once, all right? So as you can see, this sometimes stops on some pretty um, funny looking uh, faces that I'm making <laughs> during this. It always seems to catch a really weird thing, so uh, it's okay if you want to laugh. I know that, that they're just kind of funny looking because it always seems to catch you at a weird point, so anyway. All right, so uh, we are looking at 10.1, and this is gonna be the introduction for the nervous system. Uh, the nervous system basically is the control center. We think of the nucleus as the control center for the cell. Well, the nervous system is the control center for the large whole body. So it oversees everything that we do. It's a large network of cells that communicate, uh, sends and receives messages and information. It will actually detect changes in the environment and respond to those changes. Stimulate your muscles and glands uh, to elicit a response to those changes and then send a message back and uh, tell something like your muscles to shiver if you're too cold. So it's basically in charge of everything. It oversees almost everything in one way, shape, or form. Um, the nervous system is made mostly of neural tissue, uh, and you may recognize this from anatomy one from histology. We didn't do a whole lot of nervous tissue because it can be kind of difficult, but you should be able to tell looking at this picture here um, that this is nervous tissue, and this is a neuron. Here is the cell body, okay, and these are dendrites. Right? Perhaps one of these would be acting as the axon. All right. Um, in fact, actually, that was the one I pointed out. Okay. So we've got your cell body, dendrites, um, and then there's some nuclei there of neuroglial cells, and those will have some other functions as well. Uh, it also contains blood cells and connective tissue. So the two basic types of cells, though, are going to be these neurons and the neuroglial cells, okay? And so neurons are the ones that transmit the message. They send the message along. They're uh, transmitters, and neuroglial cells are uh, going to have some other functions. All right, so we have two basic divisions of the nervous system, and then we can break those down further as well. Uh, we've got the central nervous system, which is the brain and the spinal cord, uh, so it's central. And then peripheral, remember peripheral means towards the outside, you know, you have your peripheral vision. Uh, and so the peripheral nervous system uh, is going to be the nerves that go to and from the central nervous system. Alright, so the central nervous system has branches off and that's the peripheral. We can then break the peripheral down into what we call somatic. That is going to be things like touch and hearing and muscles. Soma means body cells, if that helps you remember. And then autonomic, and these are going to be things that are automatic. All right, so it's one good way to really uh, try to keep these straight. So autonomic is things like peristalsis, and that is the rhythmic wave-like contractions um, in your intestines. All right. And so these are going to be more automatic. And then we also have uh, a breakdown into the sympathetic, which is kind of like where all your fight or flight responses are. And then your parasympathetic, which is kind of the housekeeping or keeping everything orderly and maintained. All right, so I try not to do too much labeling. Um, since that's part of lab, but I do like to point out a few of these, especially some of these really nice APR images. Uh, and this is one example, of course, you should know where the spinal cord is, but so central nervous system, remember, is the center. So that is your brain and your spinal cord that goes along the center. All right, and then so remember peripheral is the periphery. So if you can just remember peripheral vision is on the side or coming out to the side. Uh, and these are hard to see here, but we have these nerves shooting off right here. These are some cranial nerves. And then you have some coming up here. 
in the oculo. And then these little lines here, those are some uh, peripheral spinal nerves, all right? And so we are gonna learn the 12 cranial nerves. Uh, normally for our SA, we learn the 12 cranial nerves, um, the names of them, uh, and then the order they go in, and then also whether they're sensory, motor, or both. Uh, and so if you're taking this in the summer, uh, you may not have that essay, but in, in class, that it is a really good uh, place where that will probably be your essay. And I'll give you some good helpful mnemonics to learn that with, and there's also a really, really, really good diagram uh, there's a guy on YouTube called Armando uh, Hostugan, I think is how you say his name. You will have links to that, and he does a really good job of drawing these things out color-coded. I do that in class for lecture. Um, if I have a good copy of that video, I'll put it here, but more than likely, I'm just going to stick his video on here for you to watch. And if you will do that, uh, it's going to help you tremendously in learning these cranial nerves and what they do because you draw pictures out and uh, I'm gonna try to also make sure to remember I have one that I drew out where you can just kind of draw in the nerves as he goes so you don't have to worry about drawing all the pictures but as I think about them and the nerves I, I can see these pictures he drew in my mind and so that helps me remember them and so pictures are very very important in anatomy and so drawing things out and color coding them especially in anatomy too and especially when we get to things like the vascular system this is so 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 helpful to make you learn it you spend less time studying so please take heed use those videos um, and use the handouts that I make to go with them if I have them for you and color code it's going to save you time and if I know anything about students I know you want to spend less time working right okay we all do work smarter not harder okay and so use that color code and use those pictures all right, so here we can see the central nervous system uh, on the left uh, and then some components of the peripheral nervous system on the right. Uh, so central nervous system, brain and spinal cord, and then cranial and spinal nerves for peripheral. The peripheral nervous system receives that information from sensory receptors. If I touch a hot stove, I have sensory receptors in my hand that are going to sense that change. And they are going to send a message up through the peripheral nerves to the spinal cord, which then sends it to the brain and decides what to do with that information, okay? Um, it decides what needs to happen. And so if you have your hand on a hot stove, what do you need to do? You need to pull it back, right? And so it goes to the brain and the brain says to the muscles, sends a message back to the muscles and says, pull your hand away. And so that message is gonna come back through the brain, through the spinal cord, out through the peripheral nerves, okay? And tell your muscles to move and pull back. Okay. We call these effector organs. Uh, we also have effector glands, like things that make us sweat if we're too hot, so we can help cool the body down. And so these guys work together in conjunction, and they're very, very important. All right, so we're going to look at some of the uh, general functions of the nervous system. We have three functions uh, that are three basic functions. Sensory, which we've talked about a little bit. Uh, integrative and that's where we take it to the brain and determine what we want to do with that information all right and then motor and that is the response that we have when we send the information out to cause like I said our muscles to shiver all right so sensory set receptors at the ends of neurons in the peripheral nervous system provide that information by just detecting those changes by feeling that hot stove or determining that it's cold outside. We have hot and cold receptors. Uh, so this, this information is sent into the brain and the brain has to decide what to do with that information. How do we integrate that information, okay? Uh, and so we're gonna convert that into a, an impulse. And it's almost kind of like your cell phone. Your cell phone or a fax machine converts information into binary code, right? Which is then in sent and then it's interpreted by the device and then made back into sound again all right so that's a very good analogy if you want to think of it that way okay
okay? So that information has to be integrated or converted. It's converted to impulses that go along the peripheral nerves into the central nervous system, and then they're integrated um, into the brain, and it, it, your brain determines what to do with it. Um, they come together basically and form a sensation, all right? Um, and this is how we get things like, um, well, our sensations, uh, they can also help form memory. And this is why memory can be tied to things like s certain smells, um, even thoughts. And then we can use those to make conscious decisions and sometimes even unconscious uh, reflexes, right? Um, so motor sensations are acted upon by motor neurons, all right? So I already said we had sensory neurons and motor neurons, okay? Uh, and so nerves sometimes have one fu one purpose or the other, and sometimes they have both. Uh, so effectors are then what carry out motor neurons. I'm sorry, motor functions. Um, they they are the one that causes the effect. So if I'm cold and I need to shiver, the effector would be the muscle. Uh, they are outside of the nervous system, uh, and like I said, they include muscles and also glands are some very common effectors. Um, so the motor portion now is going to then be divided into the somatic and autonomic divisions. So and what I would recommend is going back to that slide that has the concept map and drawing that out and trying to represent that in pictures. And that's going to kind of help you understand it a little bit better. So somatic, remember soma means body, uh, deals with conscious instructions um, like uh, well, that form the central nervous system telling your muscle to contract and autonomic remember those are the ones that deal with the subconscious or automatic uh, functions all right uh, like your heart uh, control of your viscera valves your intestines um, going to the bathroom having a bowel movement that's autonomic so neurons are the structural and functional unit of the nervous system um, they do have different sizes and different shapes, and we'll look at uh, three basic uh, shapes or types of neurons. Uh, some are very, very long um, and can even be a couple feet long, and some are very, very, very tiny depending on their function, because structure determines function, function, right? I'm sure you've heard me say that a billion times, probably you're tired of hearing me say it. Um, so, uh, neurons have the three basic things, though all of them um, share these three basic parts and that's going to be that they have a dendrite and the dendrites are what receive the information they have a cell body uh, that is where the nucleus is the center so to speak of the neuron and an axon that is going to transmit the impulse uh, it can also release neurotransmitters to another neuron or to an effector cell so we want to be sure we know the basic components of uh, a nerve so here we go oh. To shape that up a little better. This could be kind of your, and this is a terrible drawing, it's hard to draw on these screens. Basic um, nerve here. So these here, let's try a different color. These are the dendrites, all right? And then so here in the middle here, we would have the nucleus. So this would be the cell body. Uh, sometimes you hear that referred to as the soma. And then this is the axon, okay? And then these I'm trying to make look a little like they will in some of our later drawings where they can release neurotransmitters into the synaptic cleft or they continue to send the signal onto the next neuron. All right, and so information is going to travel one way. It's going to be received here at the dendrite and travel one way down the axon, okay? So this is much better than the drawing that I made. I'm sorry, I've talked with my hands and I keep dropping my little pen here for the, to draw on here with. Um, and so here is a good uh, diagram, all right? And we already said that the signal is going to go one way, and that is really important. Uh, we also, have you ever had a trolley horse? Okay, think about that. That's kind of painful, right? Um, we also don't want the transmission or the signal to be able to be sent over and over and over again because that would be kind of like having a trolley horse. You would get stuck. And so we have what we call a refractory period, okay? So when that signal is sent, we call that an action potential. And it seems to me now, for some reason, this so slide seems a little out of place. Uh, but action, 
potential. All right, action potential. And I'll erase that here in a minute so it's not too distracting, okay? So an action potential is given um, at a point on the membrane. And once that action potential is fired, you cannot refire it for a certain period of time. It's kind of like you have to recock the gun. Actually, it's very much kind of like that, okay? You have to be able to recock or reset the, the axon. All right, we're going to talk about membrane potential um, and look at how that occurs, but you need to remember there is a period of time where it is uh, no longer able to receive messages. Okay, And that's really important so that we don't have multiple signals sent um, at the same time. All right, and it's one-way travel that's really important as well. Remember, it's going to be received by the dendrite, so here, and have one-way travel. Axons undergo what we call those action potentials to deliver information, um, which is going to typically then release a chemical neurotransmitter uh, from the axon terminal to continue sending the information or causing that effector to respond. All right, so here's an, another good diagram of the neuron structure. This would be a really good one to draw out and label. Uh, almost everything on here is important. You can see here we have the cell body here, okay? This is what's called the axon hillock, and uh, that is the point where the action potential uh, must reach, and then it fires, all right? And then it travels all along down the axon here. That yellow stuff that you see there is, is myelin, which speeds up the transmission. And this is what I was doing a very poor job of trying to draw on the other one. Those are synaptic knobs, and these are at the end, or the axon terminal. So the axon terminal is the end, uh, and that's where we can often see some neurotransmitters released. Uh, the spaces between uh, these myelin sheaths here, that's the yellow things, are called nodes of Ranvier. Uh, we'll talk about those. They allow things to speed up and go quicker because basically the message can skip over that and jump. So it basically jumps from one little section to another. Uh, you can see here we also have the nucleus labeled uh, and the dendrites are labeled. So this would be something really good, especially for lab, but really just to even understand what's going on, you need this for lecture as well. This is another really good diagram here. You can see how these nerves can transmit signals from one to another, okay? And so if you look at the little blue or green lines here, they're receiving information here, and you're going to get information to a certain point, and it has to reach a, a threshold amount to trigger an action potential, and that's gonna occur here at the heel or the axon hillock, right? The heel is kind of a, a taller place, in this case it's more of a widening place, um, and so it's going to have to be at a certain threshold amount, and then it's going to follow down the body through the axon, and you can see the little blue arrows here showing you the direction of signal. Let's pin. Let's try the other one. Uh, and then you have the terminals, and in this case here, the terminals are sending that information on to the next neuron in the system, all right? Uh, and so, when it gets there though, it looks like they're touching here, but you can see in this little picture right here, they're not actually touching. What they do is they transform, they change form. You know, we have energy uh, can be transformed. The law of conservation of energy tells us that energy um, is not created or destroyed, it only changes form. Uh, and this is basically following that principle, you're going from a uh, electrical signal basically to a chemical signal. So you're going to get to the end of this synapse here and it's going to cause these little vesicles there to open up and spill their contents into what we call the synaptic cleft. And that's where you can see where this is coming down here and then here's the next, sorry, that was drawn, I didn't know it. The next, this little space right here in the middle is the synaptic cleft. And so it releases chemicals there, they go to the other side and are picked up by little receptors here on the other side, which then send that electrical signal, they're reconverted once they get in here to the soma and send the electrical signal on down the road. 
So it's kind of like an exchange. They're just sending it on down the road. All right, so I've kind of already mentioned that we have myelin. Myelination is made of lipids and proteins. Well, what are lipids? Lipids are fats, right? What, is, what does a fat do? It insulates, okay? So this kind of insulates. You almost look at this as kind of like if you look at like coax cable or, or some type of cable, um, even wire, you've got the, the metal part inside um, here, and uh, then you have the plastic outside that keeps the electrical signal basically from leaking out. And so that's basically what myelination is like. Um, it aids in the transmission of the impulse. It helps it to speed up. So a myelinated axon is conduct, going to conduct faster. It's going to send the signal faster. Like I said a moment ago, it can jump from one uh, Schwann cell, and that's the little section of myelin there, to the next. And so it helps it to uh, do what we call saltatory conduction. And so we have white matter, which is going to be the myelinated axons. And then we have gray matter, which is unmyelinated. So that is important to remember. White is myelinated, gray is unmyelinated, all right? Um, and so white is lighter and color fat tends to be white or yellowish, so you can, maybe that will help you keep them straight. Uh, cell bodies and dendrites tend to be the more gray matter. And of course, white matter is gonna be more along the axons where they transmit the signal. Okay, so here we're gonna look at the three types of neurons, uh, sensory, motor, or integrative, and that is based on their function, uh, but we can also classify them by their size and shape. So the structural differences uh, have led us to put them into groups. We have what we call bipolar, unipolar, and multipolar. So let's look at those. All right, so multipolar neurons have many processes coming from the cell body. Uh, most neurons in the brain are the spinal cord or this type. Uh, this is the most abundant type in the body. It does give us about 99% of our neurons. Then we have bipolar neurons, and bi meaning two. Uh, that's going to have two processes, um, one on each end, and we're going to look at a picture of these. Uh, and they look similar, but they one will act as an axon, and the other one will act as a dendrite. Uh, and these are found in things like the eyes, the nose, and the ear. Uh, unipolar neurons have processes, single processes from the cell body, and that's divided into two branches acting as a single axon. Um, you have an aggregate or ganglia or a gang of these together outside of the brain in the uh, spinal cord. So you'll have, these will come in like little clusters. All right, so here's your multipolar ne neuron here on the left here, multipolar. Uh, it's got many processes you can see coming here, uh, many dendrites um, from the cell body. Uh, most neurons in the brain or spinal cord member are this type. Uh, and then the bipolar, you can see you've got the cell body here in the middle, and then two extending, two processes, one on each end. They look the same unless you look really close, and you can see that these uh, these here don't have the little knobs, so those are the ones acting as dendrites, and these down here where the uh, knobs are, are the ones that uh, are going to reach a synaptic, synaptic cleft and release things, release neurotransmitters, I should say, all right? So they're going to help send the signal. So you can see the arrow is pointing for the direction that they are going to go. Unipolar neuron is a single process. Now it kind of looks like two, but if you look carefully, you'll see that this is one and is coming off the side there of the cell body. So it's two branches that act as a single axon. And these are the ones that aggregate in a gang or as ganglia located outside of the brain and spinal cord. All right, so neurons are also classified, as we said, on the basis of function. We have afferent, which carry uh, information to the central nervous system, and efferent, which carries them away. And that is kind of hard to keep straight, because afferent, you want to think away, but it's not. Uh, afferent is going to be two, so afferent is going to the brain, all right? So sometimes it helps me when something is backward is just I remember 
afferent and efferent, how do I keep them straight? Well, it doesn't make sense. If it made sense, afferent would be away, but it doesn't make sense. So afferent is coming to, into the body, to the central nervous system, um, and going, efferent is going out to the peripheral or exit. That's one good way to remember it, exit. Efferent means it's exiting, and, and now it's not leaving the body, but that just helps to remember is leaving the center of the body to the peripheral nerves. Okay, so you can find ways to help yourself remember things and keep them straight like that, all right? Um, so sensory neurons uh, are afferent. Um, interneurons are kind of in between. They're, they're within the central nervous system. Talking too fast. Within the central nervous system. And then motor neurons carry information to effectors, all right? The sensory neurons are going to send impulses from the peripheral body uh, to the brain or spinal cord, so that's afferent. They detect those changes in the outside world and send it to the boss to say, hey, what do you want me to do with this information? Interneurons are kind of specialized little relays in the brain or spinal cord, and their sole purpose is to kind of fill in the gaps. They form a link with other neurons. That's what they do. Um, so they fill in the gaps when, when there's uh, something needed to take that space. Motor neurons are going to send impulses out of the brain, so exit to effectors. It's another good way to keep it uh, straight as well. Uh, motor neurons are going to stimulate things like your muscle cells or your glands to secrete. This is just a good diet. This is showing us the four different types of neuroglial cells. We have astrocytes. Uh, astro meaning star, and you can see the astrocytes. I'm trying to find a good color. This is an astrocyte here. And then we have oligodendrocytes uh, right over here, all right? Microglial cells, so micro meaning smaller. And then we have ependymal cells over here, ependymal cells. Now, let's talk a little bit about what those do. So think of those astrocytes. Remember, astro means uh, star-like. And these are four types of neuroglia in the central nervous system. Okay, astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, microglial, uh, and ependyma or ependymal. All right, uh, astrocytes are going to be somewhat star-shaped, found between uh, the neurons and blood vessels. They help metabolize metabolize molecules like gl glucose, regulate ion concentrations, that type of stuff. Um, so they're support support for neurons. They provide nutrients and regulate movement of substances between blood vessels and the central nervous system. Um, these guys are important because they help to form that blood-brain barrier. Oligodendrocytes are similar to astrocytes, but they're smaller and they don't have as many processes. Uh, these guys produce the myelin in the brain, so they're really important. Uh, if you don't have myelin on those axons, and we see that in degenerative diseases where that signal is interrupted, uh, kind of like your cell phone cord when it starts to get frayed and it'll charge and then not charge and then charge and then not charge. And that can actually cause problems um, in our body with that conduction not working correctly. Um, so anyway, these produce myelin in the brain and the spinal cord. Then we have microglia, and these are micro meaning small. These have the least amount of processes, and they're scattered all throughout the central nervous system. Uh, they help support neurons, and they do things like phagocytize bacterial cells and cell debris. So they're they're kind of like janitors, kind of cleaning up, all right, which is really important. Um, they tend to show up where you have inflammation. If your brain or spinal cord is infl inflamed, they're going to be there trying to clean stuff up. Uh, ependymal um, are cube, uh, cuboidal or columnar, and some of them can have cilia. Uh, so think of uh, epidermis or epithelial, and that helps you think more like skin-like type because they kind of resemble that. All right. Uh, these line the central canal of the spinal cord, uh, and they form uh, one cell layer membrane, which covers ventricles that are in the brain. Uh, the blood-brain barrier we mentioned is a very selective, semi-permeable semi border that separates the circulating blood from the brain and the extracellular fluid in the central nervous system. 
This is really important because it protects our brain, which is our control center, from microorganisms and toxins and, and many things, because there's only a few things that can cross that blood-brain barrier. So that's a very important uh, component. All right, now in the peripheral nervous system, we have two types of neuroglial cells, and that's gonna be those Schwann cells and satellite cells. So remember, we looked at the Schwann cells with the myelin. So these produce myelin, which is found on those myelinated neurons, okay? And then the satellite cells support clusters of neuron cell bodies. Remember those gangs, we call them ganglia. All right, so the clusters together, it's like a gang, uh, and those are in the peripheral nervous system. So we learned about how the body um, cells uh, divide and replace themselves and replenish themselves. Well, not all cells do that. Uh, neuroglia or neurons are not able to divide. Uh, so injury to neurons, this is why uh, injury to the nervous system can often, not always, but can often be permanent. Nerve damage is usually going to be permanent. Injury to a cell body uh, is usually going to kill the neuron, all right, because uh, mature neurons no longer divide. Uh, the destroyed cell does not normally get replaced. Uh, damaged peripheral nerve uh, axons, however, can undergo some regeneration. So that's why I say s most of the time they, they when they're damaged, um, you can't fix it, but there are some instances when we can. Damaged peripheral axons can regenerate. Um, growth is slow and it takes a long time, uh, but eventually it can reestablish a connection. Uh, this is helped by things like nerve growth factors. Sometimes when it regenerates, it might not be exactly in the same exact place, so it's not full function or function is not quite normal. Okay, um, and so just understanding where the injury occurs can be really important. So here are five events that can occur um, in a myelinated axon if injury occurs. Uh, the nerve proximal portion, of course, it's going to be on the left. Okay, if it occurs there, it may survive. Uh, so if you look at the site of injury here, let's explain that a little bit. So the injury is here. It's not occurring here. So this part of the nerve can survive, all right? Uh, the proximal end can uh, regenerate some, so it, it may regenerate some, uh, a little bit here, possibly. Um, the distal portion, which is this end over here, is going to start dying because it is not attached to the body anymore, the cell body. Um, and so the distal portion will begin to degenerate, and you see that in the second section here. Okay, so. The distal end, all this portion of the Schwann cells of the axon there, um, those can uh, degenerate. Sometimes the Schwann cells can extend uh, and grow and reestablish a connection, uh, and, but again, it may not be exactly the same, and it may not work exactly uh, as well as it did. In fact, usually, you know yourself, once you have an injury, things almost never return completely to normal. Axons in the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system do respond to injury differently because axons in the central nervous system do not have what we call neuro, neurolemma. Uh, and so those are not as likely to be able to regenerate, all right, especially in things like in, in the spinal cord proper. Although we do have lots of promising technology that we're looking at in the future for that. So we're going to end up this one, and it's going a little over 30 minutes. I'm trying to, to wrap this up. Uh, we've talked a little bit about the synapse, okay? And remember, that is the point where you have the uh, axon terminal meeting up with the dendrite here on another uh, nerve cell, okay? Nerves are communicating uh, with each other in order to transmit the messages. Uh, and they do this at a synapse. Think of it again like you're texting. You have somebody that's sending the message and somebody that's receiving the message. All right, so you gotta have a sender and a receiver. So the neuron sending the message or impulse to the synapse is what we call the presynaptic neuron. Pre, because it's the one before the synapse and the one receiving the message is the postsynaptic neuron, okay? So presynaptic and postsynaptic. 
Um, these are separated by an actual space, by a gap, right here, and we call this the synaptic cleft, synaptic cleft. And so that electrical impulse cannot jump from one to the other, all right? So we're going to send neurotransmitters. You can kind of see them over here in this picture, chemical messengers, and they are going to be received on the other side. So the impulse travels um, along the axon of the presynaptic, so it's going to be coming down here. When it comes down here, you can see we have synaptic vesicles, all right? And these synaptic vesicles are triggered to go to the membrane cell and release their contents by exocytosis, exo, right? And so they release whatever is the chemical is in here, and that could be something like calcium ions or uh, serotonin. In this case, you can see here is calcium, all right? And so those are gonna be released uh, into the synaptic cleft. That's a chemical messenger. They're going to be received by these little terminals and picked back up here, okay? And then that's gonna be taken into the next neuron and then that's going to be converted again to an electrical signal and send that message on down the line, okay? And so we're just changing form here. Um, these can be excitatory, which means they can turn something on, and I'm talking about the neurotransmitters, or they can be inhibitory, where they turn something off. So we have lots of checks and balances and switches to turn things on and off, and we often do that using these neurotransmitters. All right. So that's the end of part one. Um, um, dig in, take some good notes, read your chapter. That's really important. Have a good day.